All right, well, we'll get started here. Welcome all. Um, my name is Kyle Shelton. I'm the director of the Center for Transportation Studies. It's great to have you all joining us today for this webinar. Um, I'm going to introduce our, our guests and presenters in just a moment here, but I just wanted to start by uh, thanking all of you for joining um, and, and flagging that this webinar is a part of CTS's theme for 2024, which is rural needs and statewide answers. And obviously today's conversation is hopefully uh, international answers and international input as well. Um, throughout the year, we're highlighting research that is being done or has been done by U of M and other uh, colleagues. Um, in rural transportation, we're thinking with partners like yourselves about some of those challenges in, in greater Minnesota and across uh, the nation, hopefully the world, as today's conversation will discuss. Um, and we're just really excited to, to have Janet and Mitch here with us today to talk about their work. Um, and I will just give you a couple of reminders. This is a webinar format. So if you have questions, there's a Q&A um, box that you can add those in at any point. We'll be turning to those after the end of the presentation from Janet and Mitch. Um, but you're welcome to drop those Q&As in at any point. Um, but that's the best way to interface with us and, and to have those questions followed. We are recording this, um, just so you're aware as well. Um, and with that, I will um, introduce our speakers. So we're really excited to have Janet Ote with us, uh, who's based in Uganda and has 10 years of experiencing, experience managing a range of development projects. Um, and she's a community-based research leader for the Bikes for Development Group and has been leading the work there in Uganda. And so it's great to have Janet. And then we also have uh, Mitch McSweeney, who is an assistant professor of sports management in the School of Kinesiology here at the University of Minnesota um, and has done research uh, on a range of topics and is in including this project with Bike for Development um, and on that team with Janet and others from around the, uh, the globe. So we're really excited to have Janet and Mitch with us um, and I am gonna hand it over to them to run through their presentation and I will hop back on uh, for the questions part. Awesome. Thanks very much, Kyle, for that uh, introduction. So yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Mitch. Um, Jane and I are both excited to be here today and uh, appreciate being invited by the Center for Transportation Studies to talk about this work that we've been doing for almost seven years now. So just to give um, a bit of background, um, this project has been supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Um, that's who's been funding this project in, in two different phases that we'll talk about. Um, and we're part of a much larger team. So, um, you know, there's researchers from Brock University, University of British Columbia, as well as York University in Canada. And that includes uh, Dr. Lindsay Hayhurst um, at York University, who is the principal investigator of the study. And we also have a few other colleagues uh, in Uganda who aren't here today, but um, that includes Patrick A. Yule um, and Donna Patricia, who have been also community-based researchers. And we'll talk more about the partnership that we have with Union of Hope. Um, if you can see it on the right of the screen there, that's the community-based organization we've been working with for this project. All right, so to get started, uh, just a brief agenda here. Um, we're gonna give a bit of background about uh, the reasons why we started this project uh, many years ago now. The methods that we've used, we'll spend most of the time on the findings and then we'll talk uh, briefly about the implications and then open it up to questions, which we look forward to um, responding to and and hope hopefully thinking about future collaborations or potential opportunities even with some of you here. Uh, so just you you probably noticed these pictures. Um, some of these pictures have been taken by uh, research participants, and if that's the case, there is a caption just to acknowledge their input. And then if there is no caption, um, for example, those two photos on the screen, uh, those are taken by the research team. So you know, for example, the top right one there, I, I like because they're using the bicycle to carry a couch um, that was just taken from uh, our hotel when we were conducting the research. So to provide some background, um, the United Nations has really taken a keen interest in recent years in the opportunities that bicycles might afford to, of course, sustainable transport and development, um, climate change, but most notably for us, and which really drove this project, uh, was the potential that bicycles have uh, potentially for women and girls. So um, we've we've seen the United Nations uh, it really in the past years really promote the bicycle. Um, and on June 3rd, 2019, uh, Ms. Maria Espinoza Garces, who was the president of the 73rd session of the United Nations General Assembly, actually rang in a second annual World Bicycle Day. And I'm just going to read her uh, opening statement quickly here. So this commemoration of World Bicycle Day comes at a crucial time. We have just 11 years to realize the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. 
Doing so will require a dramatic increase in our efforts. Part of this must be to support new technologies, but we must also ensure we are harnessing existing tools such as the bicycle. From reducing transport emissions and road deaths to tackling obesity and other diseases, improving rural connectivity and empowering women and girls, bicycles can make a huge and crucial contribution. So that was from 2019. Um, and you can see kind of from just that and, and the United Nations recognition, recognition of a World Bicycle Day um, that the bicycle has really been framed as a tool for development, uh, particularly in relation to sustainable development goals, which many of us are familiar with, um, but also especially for women and girls. Um, and so thousands of organizations around the world have been using the bicycle for more uh, than just transport, but to actually uh, uh, respond to pressing social issues and to achieve those sustainable development goals. And so we've termed this uh, social movement, this field, whatever you would like to call it, we've termed it Bicycles for Development. Um, and we're open to other suggestions. We're aware of um, kind of uh, the historical use of traditional development and, and the connotations that go with that. Um, but that's the term that we've been using to describe this social movement. And so uh, it's the use of the bicycle to uh, contribute to development goals and respond to pressing social issues, which are quite wide ranging. Um, and so, you know, although the bicycle has been kind of valorized as this transformative object, there has been limited research from what we uh, explored in the early phases of the study that explores really the features and perceptions of the bicycle as an international development tool. And so this is where this project was born out of um, and what we're gonna describe kind of in this presentation in terms of what we found so far. You can see here on the screen quickly, um, World Bicycle Relief, which is an organization we've worked with and which is quite a large non-governmental organization. That's their Buffalo bike, they call it, um, used in rough terrains or rural areas. Uh, and they say, you know, this is not a bike, it's an engine for economic and cultural empowerment. And that's what we mean by the sense of bicycles for development. So just uh, to continue on, you know, this, this project did start in, in 2017. At the time, um, I was a, a PhD student with my advisor, Dr. Lindsay Hayhurst. Um, and it, it began with a, a grant from uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research of Cal uh, Canada. And so it started as a project focused on three countries, uh, Uganda, Nicaragua, and Canada. Uh, in the first five years, it actually became possible, just based on some community partnerships, to carry out some smaller uh, subscale, uh, or sorry, small scale sub projects in South Africa and India. Um, but the focus in kind of the, the last three to four years has remained on Uganda, Nicaragua, and Canada um, due to existing uh, community partnerships that we have. So we asked overarching questions when we think of the, the project overall, you know, what development roles do bicycles play in disadvantaged communities? How do bicycles actually enter, move within, and leave these communities? And what, if anything, kind of challenges this movement? Um, and so in this presentation, we obviously focus on Uganda. You know, Janet has been the lead community-based researcher um, since the beginning of the project. Um, and I've been involved in field work, um, especially over the in Ugandan field work over the length of the study. Uh, and so we've had multiple phases, um, which we'll cover today, and we're going to begin with the, the global mapping that we did. Um, but again, we just want to highlight that when we get to the on-the-ground fieldwork and our approach there, um, and, and the findings will focus mostly on the on-the-ground fieldwork that we've conducted, um, we'll talk a lot, um, or, or we'll talk about work that we did with Union of Hope, that community-based organization, uh, and they provide bicycles to HIV-positive women in rural areas of northern Uganda. So I know this map, when you're looking at it, it's, it's probably couldn't give you a sense of direction since it's, it looks quite messy. Um, so, but, but this is a, a global map that we uh, kind of constructed way back in the first year of the project. And what we wanted to do um, was just start out with who is doing this work? Where are these organizations located? Um, and so the red lines actually uh, represent where these organizations implement BFD programs. Um, and the blue lines uh, that are drawn there represent the flow of money that funders provide or financial support or bicycle donations to those BFD or Bicycle for Development organizations and programs. Um, so, I'll, I'll, you know, like I said, the, it's a bit messy. We haven't updated since uh, the, the first or second year there. But um, to give some sense of what we found when we constructed this map about the Bicycle for Development social movement, uh, we found out that a, a majority of organizations were created in the United States, Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom, um, whereas the bulk of bicycles are distributed in regions of Africa, Central America, and South Asia. Um, so most organizations do operate internationally, 
although some focus primarily on um, certain regions or domestic contexts such as uh, Canada. Um, and so that kind of follows, if you think about traditional international development aid, uh, follows the kind of global north providing um, uh, 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 resources to the global south in some sense. Um, and so social goals varied by organizations and location, and that included, for example, attention to poverty, enhancing mobility just generally, uh, empowerment of women, uh, gender equality, access to education was uh, highlighted by many organizations, health promotion, and then market as accessibility. Um, and then they operated in multiple ways. So when we think of all these organizations doing this work, I um, some just collected, used, donated, or broken bicycles, and then they shipped those bicycles and bicycle parts to different uh, regions of the world and organizations doing work in that region. Um, and that was mostly, again, from the global north to the global south. So when we're thinking about the movement of bicycles. Second is that um, many use bicycles for development programming. Um, so promoting girls uh, empowerment. And um, they were mostly community driven bicycle for development organizations. Um, third is that some just sold bicycles at low cost, um, whether those were manufactured, donated or just built. Um, and they would sell those to local bike shops in marginalized areas of the global south. Um, to spur local economies um, and invest in community employment. So they would hire local community members. And then fourth is sometimes uh, these organizations would use proceeds of sold bicycles to open bicycle shops, um, train bicycle mechanics, um, and more generally try and invoke a kind of cost-friendly form of mobility for populations with limited access, access to transportation resources and options. So that's just to give an overview. That was, uh, again, kind of in the early stage of this project to give us a sense of who is doing bicycle for development work. And I'm gonna hand it over to Janet at this stage. Okay, thank you so much, Mitch. Now, following the global mapping, we then reached out to those organizations to gain further understanding of bicycles for development. So our interview questions were focused on topics such as the goals and objectives of the organizational work, strategies for collecting and distributing bicycles uh, to specific populations and perspectives about the BFD movement and the challenges involved in the global transport of bicycles and organizational approaches to measuring the impact of the bicycle, among other topics. Initially, we had 33 interviews with 20 individuals. 10 virtually, four by phone, and 19 in person in Uganda. Among the interviewees were founders, employees, volunteers, and mechanics. Now, three fi key findings were first, interviews with executives from the BFD organizations revealed how government regulations restricted or facilitated their development work. Now, for example, Various executives spoke about how government uh, government import and export taxes were particularly high in certain locations, especially here in Uganda. It was making it very difficult to get more bicycles to target populations. For example, one sports bike is about $35. Uh, for taxation. Now that may look some little money, but it may be an income for someone for a full month. And if you're going to put that on taxation, it's so hard. And for others, that's even harder. Second, the material nature of the bicycle was important to consider. Bikes need to be suitable for usage in local contexts where they are shipped. The steadiness of the bicycle is a key consideration in regard to having a bicycle that is suitable for local context and which complicates the assumed state forward relationship between bicycle donations in one context, for example, in the global north, and bicycle provision in another. This also related to whether the bicycle repair parts would be available because there are not so many. Some of the bicycles that are imported is very hard to get the spare parts. And lastly, uh, environmental conditions were the, was a third theme that we found. The successful use of bicycles was often partially contingent on the physical context where they are used. For example, droughts, floods, and other weather impacts 
were highlighted as influencing the use of the bicycle. Uh, we move to the next slide. Okay, so regarding the field work in Uganda, the third phase of the research sought to understand the impact of bicycles within the lives of those targeted by the BFD initiatives. We had, we developed a partnership with Union of Hope, one of the BFD organizations involved in phase two of the study to explore the impact of bikes for HIV positive women and girls in multiple communities. So we had a participatory action research approach uh, used for this phase of the study. We had two phases occurring and field, and field work was undertaken from November to December of 2018 with 18 women in the two rural communities in Kwania, that is in Northern Uganda. We also had a second phase of field work that took place in May, 2022 with 30 women from three different rural communities participating in this phase. Uh, multiple methods were used, including photo voice, uh, where we specifically used cameras, which were provided to participants to take photos of their experience. Uh, otherwise, in other places, people can use cell phones, but the women who are dealing with didn't even have those smartphones to use for taking pictures. We also had photo collaging, using photos from photo voice to construct layouts of images to express meaning of topics to participants. And digital storytelling, where a video and picture rep representation that tells the story of an individual and community was done. Uh, so before I think we can go to the next slide, so before sharing our findings, it would be important to provide some further context of the communities, um, uh, the communities where the research was undertaken. Uh, specifically here in Uganda, uh, we carried it out in rural Uganda. And Uganda has a population of about 42 million people. But of the 42 million people, 48% of the households uh, in the lowest or second lowest wealth quintile. So we are talking of people who are really living in a low income. And 37% of households in rural Uganda own a bicycle compared to 21% in urban areas. 55% of households spend 30, at least 30 minutes to acquire drinking water. And 30 minutes would be okay for some. Others might even move one hour, two hours to get drinking water. And then in Kwania district, 96% of the people live in rural areas. So we are talking about all, uh, more, not over 90% of the people living in this kind of statistics, poverty, uh, less bicycles and uh, you know, challenges, no drinking water nearby and even no electricity nearby. I think I will I'll hand over to Mitch to carry on from there. Yeah, thanks, Janet. And so we're going to move into uh, the findings at this point and talk first about uh, overarching benefits of Bicycle for Development, uh, specific to Uganda, and then talk more about um, some of the challenges and, and potential unintended consequences that we found in our work. So, you know, one, one of the main benefits uh, you could think of and, and that, that we found is that the bicycle is a key transportation tool, right? It's for healthcare, for livelihood activity, uh, for education, especially taking children to school, um, traveling to markets. So some research participants actually spoke about doubling or tripling um, their income based on just traveling to market multiple markets within a day rather than just one when they were walking. Um, also leading to more time for household chores, as well as uh, particularly for women, um, some of which who uh, were widowed, uh, attending community and recreational events, which was actually really important for um, creating a sense of belonging, for representing their communities or representing themselves within their communities um, was also another key finding. So 
basically overall the bicycle enhanced access to a variety of facilities and activities. Um, you know, participants indicated that bicycles were important for traveling long distances up to 15 to 20 kilometers or more um, to health centers in particular for their health checkups, for the collection of medication, um, as well as other health treatments, and that included sexual and reproductive health services. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, saving time and costs for other activities. The bicycle, um, once received uh, from Union of Hope, really moved additional cost of transportation, um, as well as the time spent. Um, a lot of women spoke about, for example, travel to markets that would take up to uh, one to two hours to travel there, as well as carrying their goods or, or their products that they were going to sell. Um, and then also having to go to that market and then come back home another one to two hours. And so the bicycle was able to reduce that time. Um, and as I mentioned, household chores came up a lot as well. And we're going to return to that when we speak more um, about the uh, challenges of bicycle for development too. And you can see there, um, you know, I won't read the, the quote in full, but um, it made uh, activities and tasks much easier. Um, visiting the hospital, taking children to the hospital. Uh, even taking children for vaccinations. One uh, other just quick note here, kind of a side note that we didn't explore in depth is that bicycle ambulances are very popular as well in northern Uganda based on um, limited uh, access to, to health and hospitals when there is an emergency. So that was um, something we didn't explore, but also something very in interesting in terms of how people get to the hospital. So a second uh, kind of key benefit um, was that we found that bicycles really contributed to women's agency, their self-organization, and their livelihoods. So um, what we found when we started this work was that women were self-organizing and self-governing in what they called bicycle savings groups. Um, and these saving groups consisted of 30 members who saved specific amounts of money on a week or bi-weekly basis, and then distributed that money annually or biannually amongst members. And that included um, distributing money when someone needed a loan, and then paying back at smaller interest rates. Um, and, and this is similar to microfinance uh, schemes and, and banks, formal banks within uh, the Global South and other areas of the world. Um, but these were informal savings groups uh, that the women actually self-govern themselves. You can see they select their leaders there in the quote. Um, and this money was really useful uh, for family support, for education, for food, for living expenses. Um, and what this was key for as well was that it contributed, the bicycle was really key for these groups to uh, effectively operate um, because they were able to travel to markets to get to school and then come back and actually travel to the group itself. And then uh, a third key finding, oops, sorry, I'm actually going to hand this over to, to Janet. Sorry about that, Janet. I got, I got carried away there. Okay, we also found that uh, bicycles were promoting uh, solidarity, respect, and status in the community, as you can see in some of those quotes. Um, women's solidarity and a safe space was a key issue that we found out. The bicycle group benef um, benefits the collective of women. The bicycle serving groups emphasized it as a space where women's issues could be openly discussed and help could be requested, whether in regard to their families, the community, and their HIV status. This was especially important for women given their HIV status, as well as for some women being widowed. Especially in the Ugandan context, there is a lot of uh, stigma, especially in the rural areas regarding HIV. So, but these women dis demystified that because of the power of the group. Bicycles were also reported to foster more respect for women. You see, for both participants who were widowed and those who had a partner, the provision of the bicycle was reported to foster respect in domestic household and, uh, and influenced increased autonomy of women, which led to new opportunities for women to freely pursue livelihood, activities. Um, with increased respect, unity, and solidarity amongst the women, there was a challenge in some of their roles and status within the community. Though there were numerous reported benefits and opportunities offered by the bicycle, there was also noticeably some challenges. And some of these challenges, uh, as we can see, 
One of them is the bicycle costs and uh, breakdown. As I already said earlier, the, the bicycles can be so costly. Uh, for example, between between one uh be between one hundred dollars maybe that is the cheapest bicycle you could get and that could be a second hand all the way to one thousand dollars but this is income that is not very easy for a woman to get and even when they have the bicycle there is a problem of uh, purchase breakdown maintenance and repair costs high costs ranging anywhere from uh, uh in terms of repair it could be about two thousand. Uh, it it could be about one uh, five thousand Ugandan shillings, which could be maybe about twenty dollars. Let's say, up to about uh, one hundred dollars of people talking about repair costs per month, and this would make it difficult for people to own bicycles um, if the costs are so high. Bicycle breakdowns are in most cases because of riding on poor roads, limited skills for repairs, lack of spare parts that are costly to import, and multiple tasks and uses and needs for the bicycle. I think you saw a picture earlier with a lot of cabbages in a sack. And so these people use it for businesses and carry so many heavy things. So it is hard for them to, to, to carry the bicycle. Now, if you look at one of the pictures there and you see such roads, in the rural areas, that is very common to find roads like that, and they keep on affecting the uh, affecting the bicycles to break down. Another problem, another problem was the inclusion and exclusion criteria. The inclusion and exclusion of bicycles for development programs was a real problem. Now, some of the community members felt excluded by the BFD membership regulation specifically in Kwania where we're working. For instance, many non-HIV positive community members and men uh, felt unfairly excluded from the bicycle savings groups. The exclusion led to jealousy, bicycle theft, and other harassment of women and girls in the bicycle saving groups. In this, the bicycle also acted as a stigmatizing and exclusionary tool Although Union of Hope encouraged the women to share and encourage testing, thus turning a problem into a positive. As we said earlier, that uh, the bicycles were given to HIV positive women. And some uh, people were saying, is it very, how about us when we are not positive, we also need help. And how about the positive men? Look at this quote. The advice I would give is when you are starting a group, you don't just select that you want people who are sick only. You should also involve the other people to also get the help. All people who have given birth to many, you should see that. Okay, uh, so, sorry, okay. All people who have given birth to many, you should see that if someone is interested in and has the will to join the group, what I think is you should help everyone. So it's a challenge. But you know, with the limited resources, it's hard to help everyone. And then uh, another one that we found was gender relations. We can move to the next slide. Gender relations and inequality. So while some changes in gender norms occurred as seen in regard to respect and solidarity, there were also noticeable challenges and unintended consequences due to existing gender inequalities. For instance, Women and girls are often assumed to be the primary caregivers of families and children. They are required to engage in domestic work, while the men have more time to focus their own attention on more gainful jobs and enterprises. So women are responsible for their immediate and extended family members. And then you go to northern Uganda, there's also a lot of alcoholism by men, which is a key driver for poverty and family challenges with domestic violence, among others. Some women and girls spoke to how the bike would be used primarily by the husband. Even if the bicycle was given to her, when the husband wants to use it, the woman has no one. 
One unintended consequence that came about was that the bicycle actually led to more work for women, which was, uh, you know, surprising, although they were happy for the more work. You might have noticed from the previous slides quote that the participant mentions the bicycle has simplified work, leading to an increase in economic activities on women and girls. Many women and girls spoke about how they are responsible for their children, not all, but many. And now the bicycle actually made more time for them to complete other domestic duties, such as collecting water, firewood, cooking, in addition to being the primary caregiver. And now also as taking on responsibilities of men, such as income generation. Thus, we must be cognizant of the bicycle being used to achieve certain development aims, such as gender inequality, but may also lead to unintended uh, consequence. Uh, just look at this one quote. I gave birth to six children. Among all these children, only two don't study, but the other four study. All these children, I am the one who keeps them, but this husband of mine doesn't help me in any way. These stories are very common among the women uh, that we worked with and we interviewed in Northern Uganda. I think I'll hand over to Mitch to carry on from there. Yeah, thanks, Janet. So we're going to wrap up here uh, just in regard to some of the kind of overarching implications for bicycles and the use of bicycles for development um, in rural Uganda. So, you know, the, the, the core purpose kind of this project was to figure out some of the um, insights into the lived experiences of women using bicycles in Quinea or northern Uganda um, and the benefits and challenges that comes with uh, this idea of using bicycles for development. So, you know, across our findings, what was noticeable is that the bicycle savings groups and the use of bikes um, by women in, in rural areas of northern Uganda was, of course, beneficial for transportation to access those key community services, um, while also creating spaces where women were able to use the bicycle to really uphold their knowledge and experiences of gender mobility. Um, and those bicycle savings groups, those spaces were really important, as we kind of mentioned, for HIV positive women, many of who were widowed um, and kind of in, in some cases shunned by the community to bring them together um, and the bicycle kind of enabling in some sense their, their agency. Um, and of course, you know, while we found that the, the bikes were extremely useful, um, you know, due to high taxation, especially in Uganda, bicycles and spare parts are, are not easily affordable, um, especially for those who, who often need the bicycle most. Um, uh, when we spoke with the executives in kind of phase two of this study um, from around the world, many of whom were working in Uganda or trying to work in Uganda, um, a lot of them said like the taxes are just too high and we actually deliver the bikes to other areas of the world. So what we did, had done from some of this work in terms of, you know, policy and practice, um, we just want to talk about um, some recommendations that, that have been born out of this study. Um, you know, we suggested that a tax waiver to some priority groups such as women or um, people with disabilities, among others, be given on imported bicycles and spare parts in Uganda um, to increase bicycle access, um, particularly for northern Uganda, but also for other rural areas. Um, we also suggested setting up bicycle workshops. So one of the problems that arose was bike breakdown and that bicycles would get damaged um, and that would actually lead to high costs of repair. So what can we do? Well, some of these BFD NGOs could provide um, some bicycle workshops with, with, which some did report doing, um, but providing those to be able to repair their own bikes um, if the parts are available, that is. Um, it was also important, of course, to develop a road network. Um, like other similar rural contexts, there is um, some movement towards, a, you know, there's been a non-motorized transport policy in Uganda from 2012. I don't believe it's been updated. Um, but there has been some movement to um, uh, improve bicycle infrastructure, particularly in Kampala, the capital and the urban city um, of, of the country, whereas the Uganda or the rural area where bicycles are, are used even more, uh, not so much. So, so turning a um, to bicycle infrastructure. Um, also thinking about um, how the local government might invest more in the road network in that area, um, such as safe bicycle parking areas or bicycle lanes. Um, and then reviewing program practice from a gender lens would be especially useful for BFD organizations to examine their own activities and potential unintended consequences that we found uh, within the case of Uganda. Um, 
And like I mentioned, government and policy support is, is really important. We can talk a bit more about our efforts to uh, spur some of that support. Um, but just in terms of future research um, as well, you know, there's a couple areas we noticed the, or, or noted the limitation um, that male community members weren't included in this study um, and they felt excluded. Um, and so doing future work that does include um, a wider array of community members is really important. Um, we did do uh, some, some, some minor uh, geographical information systems and participatory mapping uh, within the second phase of the study. We can talk more about some of the issues that arose. But in the future, we are seeking to um, use some more uh, GIS mapping um, to actually track where bicycles are used and, and for example, hotspots where gender-based violence might occur. Um, and then also looking more uh, uh, specifically at the health benefits of cycling for HIV positive individuals. Um, so looking more specifically at those health benefits. Um, we know that access was increased, but what other health benefits are there for the bicycles? So thank you very much for listening. I, um, I'm going to hand it back to, to Kyle and um, appreciate you uh, attending this and looking forward to, to questions. Thank you.